When I got saved uh, in Hawaii, a lot of people would go, oh, you're suffering for God in Hawaii. And I go, well, I got saved in Hawaii. So I went over there to build surfboards. And then I, I came to the Lord uh, doing stupid things in Waikiki that could destroy your family and, and all. And then I, I came to the Lord. Uh, but at that time, I didn't know anything about Calvary Chapel. And so I was going to a little church on the North Shore. It was a very traditional, liturgical kind of church, a church of Christ, uh, going there, but also hanging out with these Pentecostals. Now, the thing that I liked about the Church of Christ, because I really didn't have much of a family life growing up, I had about five different fathers and none really stuck around, so I grew up without a father figure, a father image. So when I grew up, I was very insecure, and uh, it, it translated over into my married life and doing, uh, you know, not being a real good husband. But when I started going to this, uh, this little Church of Christ after receiving the Lord, only church out there on the North Shore, uh, the thing I liked about it is being so insecure. These people are now like a mom and a dad, a grandpa and a grandma, and there was a real stability and security there. I like that, but they didn't believe in any of the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't believe all the Bible. And so when I would hang out with these Pentecostals, uh, it would, they would be very excitable. I mean, they believed everything in the Bible, and they even believed things that weren't in the Bible. And uh, so I like the excitement, and I like the security, but I, we really weren't in either of those. And then a surfer came to Hawaii, and he laid a Chuck Smith tape on me. And I listened to Chuck because my, my Bible college was my shaping room. I would get Chuck's tapes, and it would be like Christmas when I got a pack of like eight tapes or so. And I, in my shaping room, I'd be listening to Chuck, and that was basically my Bible college. But when I listened to him the first time, I realized God was doing the exact same thing here on the North Shore in, obviously, a microcosm, a micro version of that, of what he was doing in Southern California. And so there's where the connection came. From that point on, Chuck basically, to me, became a father figure, and not just a father figure, but a mentor and my pastor. And Chuck really, to me, he set, he set the example of what a template is, setting in order the church that is, is a church that is exciting, a church that is growing, a church that changes people's lives, and, and that was the template for me. And I think one of the, the worst things that uh, we could have maybe in the church or as an individual is to be without vision. And uh, one of the things that uh, Bill Holdridge said is he mentioned uh, uh, that there are those that uh, they don't know why they're here or they don't know, uh, basically, they don't have a vision for their life. And and I think that's, a, that's a, a, a problem in the church when we don't have that. We don't have a purpose or a reason to exist of who we are as, as a church. And so Paul tells Titus in verse 5 that set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I direct. So setting things in order, which means that there must have been a lot of things that were out of order. In, in the churches there in Crete, a number of churches that, that he needed to set in order. And that term set in order is a medical term. And it's to having a joint, uh, out of joint or straightening a limb. And with me, it was not the liturgical church and it was not the hyper Pentecostal, but what Chuck laid out was this straight and narrow. What I felt like, man, this is straightening what the church is to be. And so from that point on, uh, I was committed to Calvary Chapel, and we were a Calvary Chapel, even though we were in Hawaii and uh, Costa Mesa was far away. But I would have Chuck, we would have Chuck come over almost every year. But he also says appoint elders here, appoint elders in every church. And one of the qualifications, actually, you can find as you go on, and if you read this through, there are 13 positive qualifications and seven negative qualifica or, or disqualifications for ministry. Don't want to deal with those, but the one I do want to deal with is in verse 9, and that's where we pick up. 
He says, holding fast, he's talking about those who are teaching, holding fast the faithful word, which is according with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision or those who are religious. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about Jews who are religious. Some are even in the church and insisting on certain things in the church to be more spiritual. Others obviously are outside. I mean, they are the ones that gave uh, Jesus the harassment and hassle, and same with Paul. But so the especially those who are religious, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not for the sake of sordid gain. So they're into the, the whole money thing. But here, he's, he's listing these qualifications, and the chief among them is being strong in the word of God. I believe if a pastor, a deacon, or an elder is not willing to confront, that is going to disqualify them from being an elder or a pastor or a deacon. Because there's a lot of confrontation of those that come in, and they're not biblical in their you know, in their thinking and in their attitudes. And, and we need to use the word of God to straighten that bent in their life and try to get them on track. And so you find that uh, you need to confront the unruly. You need to com confront the, the false teachers because being sound in doctrine, teaching the word of God verse by verse from Genesis to Revelation, teaching it all the way through, you're not going to miss anything. And if people are there for any length of time, you're going to find that you're going to hit a topic that maybe needs to be straightened in their life. And so that's where maybe the confrontation comes or, or maybe the correction comes. Or maybe, as uh, Ron was saying, they just get up and leave. Well, that's fine. They, that's fine if they leave for the right reasons because they don't agree with the word of God. But you see, that's what Titus had to do in the churches there in Crete. He talks about, he talks about uh, those who, uh, when you're teaching sound doctrine, that's going to build up those in the church. But it's also going to drive away those that don't want that sound doctrine. And to preach sound doctrine, it requires a response from the people, from the church. And in that response, if they don't want to respond, that is disastrous. When you preach the word of God and you teach the word of God and, and it maybe ruffles some people and they don't want to respond to that, well, it can be disastrous for them. I read a story about uh, it, it was in 1984 and Avianca Airlines, it crashed in Spain and the investigators studying the incident, they made an eerie discovery. The black box cockpit recorders revealed that several minutes before the impact, a shrill computer synthesized voice from the plane's automatic warning system told the crew repeatedly in English, pull up, pull up. The pilot, evidently thinking the system was malfunctioning, snapped, shut up, gringo, and snapped the system off. Minutes later, the plane plowed into the side of a mountain. Everyone on board died. You see, the unruly, you see, those that come in uh, with a false concept of God and the word of God, when we preach sound doctrine, we're really saying to them, pull up. Change course. Be biblical. And this is, what Paul, this is what Titus is being instructed to instruct those who are leading in the church, especially in their teaching. I find whenever there's a move of God, there's also a counter from Satan. Satan always wants to disrupt. He wants to distract. He wants to take away from what God is doing. Wherever truth is proclaimed, you're going to find that air raises its ugly head. And so church leaders and pastors, they need to confront that. They can't shy away from that. They need to stand up against that. That was Titus's mission. 
to find those in the church, men who would be in charge to exhort, he says here. In other words, encourage the faithful with healthy teaching and to refute or confront and convict those who are contrary and in opposition. Martin Luther said, a preacher must be both soldier and shepherd. He must nourish, defend, and teach. He must have teeth in his mouth and be able to bite and fight. I like that. He must stand up for the word of God, bite and fight for the things of the Lord. Now, sound doctrine is the only authority that we can go and confront a person on. It's the only thing that we have to, to build people up. It can't be us and our status. It can't be, well, you've been a pastor for so long, you're qualified to speak on this issue. Not necessarily. You could be a pastor for a long time and actually be preaching heresy. You can actually be off. But you see, it's the word of God that is really where we can confront and we can use the authority of the word of God. It's not necessarily... Uh, the authority of that person because they've been around so long or they know so much. But it's really a strong leadership that is teaching the word of God. And there were a lot of false teachers, false teachers that were troubling the church in Crete, in, in uh, Crete, in numerous churches in Crete. And one of the things, as you go on in, uh, in Titus, is there were those that said, you know, it, Christ that's fine, the cross is fine, but there's a deeper experience. You could really build your churches more if you just tap into this deeper kind of knowledge. And you know, there was a lot of that heresy going on, Gnosticism and, and Jewish mysticism, and they were taking the truth of the word of God and they were allegorizing it or, or making it a, a, a kind of a, a poetry. In fact, Jewish myths, as he mentions there in four, verse 14, some are, are teaching Jewish myths and the doctrines of men. In other words, man's opin opinion, customizing the church, as I mentioned before, being an author. Boy, I want our church to be different, so we're going to do different things. We're going to be an author of a whole new movement. That's dangerous. You see, that's not new to our day and age. That was happening back in the times of, of Paul and in the times of Titus. And the Jewish myths, interesting, in fact, you find that Joseph Gare, a uh, contemporary scholar of Jewish literature and legends, he writes, in their nostalgic recollection of biblical times, preachers often went far beyond anything implied in, script in the scripture narrative. The more romanticized the stories, the more people like them. The Book of Jubilee, a contemporary of Jewish, of, by Jewish authors on the Book of Genesis, is embellished so much that the truth can hardly be discerned. Th three of the points that in, contempor in the commentary say the reason we keep the Sabbath is because the archangels kept the Sabbath. The reason we know that circumcision is so valuable is because angels were circumcised and Jacob never tricked anyone. So what you find is this Jewish mysticism that was running through the church. And that kind of thing, you know, it's in a different form, but it, but it happens today. In fact, they say in these things that when Abraham raised the knife to, uh, you know, to put Isaac to death, supposedly, I know he knew that God would raise him back, but they say the angels in heaven were so grieved that they were weeping, and the tears that are falling from heaven fell on the knife that was in Abraham's hand, and it melted it. And that, it was the, the message that don't take your son's life. Don't take Isaac's life. Now, there are things that are going around the church today, and you don't even know where a person's at. I can assume that a person is right on. But just recently, just in the last month or so, a fellow in our church that I looked at as one of our deacons, him and his wife were ushering, and uh, he would come, we, we've had a prayer meeting on Saturday morning with uh, 
you know, 20, 30 guys every Saturday morning for the last 25 years. And, and he would come regularly. And, and when he would pray, he'd always open the scripture and, and quote a scripture. This has been on my heart. And he'd quote that and then pray in context of that. And, and I, I, I like the guy because he's a surfboard guy and he's an inventor of surf products. And, and uh, you know, I, I really liked him. And then he came to me and he gave me a book. It was a book on, on uh, creation, and it was by Francis Collins. And it was with the BioLogos, or Bios Genesis people. And as I'm going through this book, and I, I gave David the book back, I said, this guy is not even a Christian. Oh, no, he's an evangelical Christian, because he claims to be. But this whole book is denying the first 11 chapters of Genesis. You've got to be careful, and you've got to be aware, because there is still mysticism going on. If you don't believe that the first 10, 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are, are literal, you're on very shaky ground. If you think it's allegorical it's a, or poetical, you've actually destroyed, I think, your whole ministry. If, you, if, you're, if you're buying into that, that it wasn't six days of creation, that we are now, it's basically, let me back up. It used to be, we used to talk about uh, evolution is the religion of the atheist. And then it moved more into the liberal Christians. The liberal Christians said, well, it's theistic evolution. Yeah, God started it, but then evolution finished it to what we have today. But now with this biogenesis, Francis Collins and all those people that are part of that, it's creation evolution. And so it was started by God, but there were, was living beings before Adam and Eve, and it took millions of years to evolve in what we have today, and you go beyond the pale of Scripture. And, you don't, and they don't believe in the flood. They don't believe in six days of creation. It goes on from there, and if you don't believe that, you've actually destroyed the foundation of the Bible. And we could go through all the areas you've destroyed. But I said to this fellow, because he came into my office after I uh, contended with him, and I'm, I'm giving him all the stuff from uh, Institute for Creation Research and then creation.com, uh, which has some really good stuff. And I'm giving him all that stuff, Ken Ham's stuff. In fact, we're just starting to use Ken Ham's Sunday school material, really good stuff. And I gave him all that stuff, and then finally he comes into my office just uh, you know, a month or so ago. And what I would tried to been working with him to bring him to you know, what the Bible says, after probably a year and a half, he comes to my office, he hands me a, a packet of material, and he says, Bill, we're leaving the church. And I said, you're leaving the church because you will not promote you know, this whole theory that, that he has. He said, I'm an inventor and I believe in facts. And these are facts. And the Bible is not a book of science. And I said, yeah, but the Bible has given scientific uh, statements even before science. The earth is round, the, the, the uh, avenues in the sea. I mean, and I went through a whole bunch of things. And, and I said, why are you looking at all these uh, evolution people because they're looking at the Bible through their evolutionary theories. They don't have facts, they have data, and they interpreted their data through their secular mindset, their evolutionary mindset. Why don't you look at uh, uh, evident, uh, Creation Institute or, or Ken Ham? And he said they're false teachers. It blew my mind because I thought this fellow was so right on set in order the things that remain. Don't take for granted that somebody is right on and, and they're believing the Bible, they're even reading the Bible. I had to come to the conclusion that he just doesn't believe the Bible or he doesn't read the Bible. You can never get into, at least in the days of Titus, into these Jewish mysticism stuff or the doctrines of man if you believe the Bible. And so they got into other things. Food back, back then in, in, uh, 
in Titus's day, food regulations and washings and days and the commandments of men. And it was the attitude of the false teachers. That's what they were into. And so he tells them that you need to deal with these false teachers. Three things about them. They're rebellious. That term there in the Greek is disloyal as a soldier refusing orders of his commander, unsubmitted. In other words, they're going their own way. And even though they're there in church listening to you, they don't agree with you. They, don't, they won't submit to the authority of the word of God. That was an eye-opener for me, and I've been a pastor for a long time. I didn't, I just figure they believe that. You see, Pastor Chuck, he set a template. Now, a lot of people, especially in Calvary Chapel, they want to change the template. They want to customize it. They want to do their own thing. And some of these are very successful in what they're doing. They've got a pretty powerful personality. But remember what Chuck said a long time ago? The Calvary Chapel is not built on personality. It's built on principles. And those principles are transferable to any person that is called to the ministry. Unfortunately, now there are some very powerful personalities around. And what are they doing? They're customizing the template that Chuck has set down. Why? Well, could it be disloyal? to the very one that was instrumental in, in founding this movement? C could it be that? As Paul is telling Titus, deal with those that are rebellious. Also, they were empty talkers. Empty talkers literally without profit, no content for spiritual growth, no power to transform. It seems like nowadays there, there's so many stories being told, there's so many jokes being told, and the personality seems to drive, drive what uh, is happening. And, and some of the younger pastors, some of the younger churches that are influenced by that, they think they need to do that. And so customizing the template, and yet when you leave from there, you go, what did I get out of that? That was, that was pretty good, but it was more entertaining then it was feeding my spirit. I realized when I first got saved, me and Danita, we were almost divorced, that close. Then I got saved and, and I told her about it and she said, well, uh, she saw a difference in me and she said, well, okay, uh, I'll stay with you for now, but if you ever become a pastor, that's when we get a divorce. <laughs> she said that. About a year later, she got saved, and we've been married over 50 years. So God does, yeah, God does. I'm more in love than I've ever been, you know, just really, really. And so what I, I, I'm, I'm getting to here is when I was hearing Chuck uh, teaching, my shaping room, I would get these tapes, I would listen to him. And Chuck, when he was teaching, it was my heart, all the evil in my heart was being wrung out. And it was being like my heart was put in a, like a, a sponge putting into the things of God. And I realized where I was failing. I realized how I messed our marriage up. And it took me seven years to mess it up. And I had to give God at least seven years to put it back together. And so I realized God through the word of God was just, you know, breaking my heart. And I realized that if I lost my wife and my kids, because I didn't want them when I was a surfer out there you know, surfing. I wanted to be free. If I lost them, I would have lost the most precious thing in my life. And it just caused me to weep because she wasn't saved at that point. And then she got saved. But it was the word of God that was doing that work in me. Not, not some flashy light show with smoke and, you know, all the, you know, bells and whistles. It wasn't that. It was the word of God. So why would we ever want to get away from that and entertain the people and say fun things. They go, oh, wasn't that a good service? Oh, I love that story about his dog. Wasn't that good? I kind of cringe when people go, wow, Bill, that story that you told about, you know, and I go, but did you get the, <laughs> did you get the message, the gist of the scripture of the, where I was going with that? You see, there's a lot of empty talkers out there. And then he says, the last thing is the deceivers. In other words, they twist the scripture. They, they replace truth for subtle error. For subtle error, they want to culturally be relevant. 
that is a great problem, I believe, in Calvary chapels today, culturally relevant. I don't think we need to change. I don't think we need to change at all. I think if Chuck, if Chuck was now part of the movement that he started, but maybe he just showed up in another body and he didn't know who he was, but he planted a Calvary. Do you think Chuck would be wearing skinny jeans <laughs> to relate, have piercings, have maybe uh, tats all over his body so he can relate to people, to use provocative, edgy language, you know, to try to draw that generation in? No, I think Chuck would be exactly what he was when you got saved, I got saved, and the ministry of Calvary Chapel started. I think it would be just like that. Wouldn't change anything. You see, Paul tells Titus, hey, they must be muzzled, or the term is silenced, but the Greek term means muzzled. And you confront that kind of thing, you talk about that kind of thing, you teach that kind of thing, and if they don't go, want to go along with it, if they reject it, well, you're going to have to reject them. I mean, good thing for our guy that left the church before I had to tell him, don't, hey, don't be sharing that stuff. Don't be passing these books out. He, he would have laughed then, but, I, you know, you have to confront those things, you know. Silence that which is not of the Lord. And what is their motive? It says, well, for the sake of sordid gain, for money. It was kind of like a Balaam-type ministry. Remember what it says about Balaam? He was into money. He was, a, he was a prophet for hire. He was a hireling, basically. In fact, Peter says, forsaking the right way, gone astray, following the way of Balin, who, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, who loved money for ministry. I heard a very disturbing thing that a pastor had con contacted another pastor. I knew both pastors. And I knew the other pastor that was coming to town, wanted him to speak in that church and ask him if he would give him $10,000 for preaching. $10,000 for preaching. When we become that popular where we demand a, a certain price to come in and preach, there's something wrong there. Barkley, not Charles Barkley, but William Barkley, not the <laughs> basketball player, but William Barclay, I think, says something good. When a teacher or a preacher looks on his ministry or preaching as a career designed for personal advancement and personal profit and gain, he is in a precarious, a precarious place. Let me end with this illustration. I thought this was really, really interesting. I hope you're not getting caught up and caught away with because maybe things haven't gone like you thought they would and not growing as fast. You've been around so long, you're thinking, I've got to change directions. I've got to look at these guys whose churches are growing and they're becoming famous. And, you know, there's a term out there, celebrity pastors. Have you heard that? Celebrity pastors because they are so popular and, you know, they, you know, get to go to, you know, around the country and all. And you're looking in that direction. It wasn't long ago, research was conducted in which a group of individuals were fitted with a special prismatic glasses, or glasses that were a prism. The glasses greatly distorted vision, causing straight lines to appear curved and sharp outlines to blur with color. As the experiment progressed, within a few days, these unnatural shapes, blurred edges, curved lines, gradually disappeared, and the brain adjusted to see these subnormal shapes as normal, the natural as the unnatural as natural. In other words, the world around them was now perceived as ordinary, natural, and normal, although they still wore the special prismatic glasses. Ron's message was stay the course. Men, women, we don't need to change the template. 
I mean, everything that we have for life and godliness is given in the word of God. And, and Chuck, the forerunner of this, you know, we don't, you know, have a, a picture of Chuck or an image of Chuck, but he's the guy. It, you went from this, maybe this denomination is me from that, and you go, hey, here, here's me. This is my DNA, the very thing that was laid out in the beginning. You see, if we compromise scripture to accommodate culture, you're going to find that you're going to wear the glasses, and then all of a sudden you're going to think that, wow, this is normal, this is right. And then all of a sudden your brothers that are holding the course and sisters that are holding the course, that the template, the DNA that has been set down, you're never going to change. Man, you're going to start seeing with those glasses, you're going to see the church in a whole different light and go in a whole different direction. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know, you know, God's plan for that. Maybe God has mercy, but I know there were a lot of uh, churches that went off uh, with a vineyard movement that came back because they saw the error of their ways. But I think afoot now, there's direction that people want to take that I don't necessarily think is healthy and don't accommodate culture. Stick with what that template that God has given. Father, we do thank you so much, Lord. And, and I just, I think back to... Uh, my experience with Calvary Chapel and Chuck, Lord, and I knew that was me. Your spirit bore witness with my spirit. And from that point on, Lord, it's just been uh, uh, sometimes feast, sometimes famine in the ministry, Lord, but you have us continue on with you, Lord, and you work things according to your will and according to your purpose. Lord, I pray for maybe some of the guys and some of the women that maybe are discouraged in in uh, what they have and maybe what they thought they would have in years past. But Lord, I do, I do believe, Lord, that uh, with your hand upon that ministry, Lord, it's doing the very work, the very purpose that you want it to do. Lord, we have no idea of how effective our ministry is. I think of Charles Spurgeon stuck in the snow, went to that little church, and that preacher who was basically, he was just a farmer. He kept saying, look unto Jesus, look unto Jesus. And it so stuck in Charles Spurgeon's heart when he left. He didn't think much of the preacher, but that scripture stuck in his heart. And we know the work that you did through Charles Spurgeon. We don't know if they're Billy Grahams coming into our church or if they're or the next uh, mighty expositor coming into our church and and yet you do, Lord, and you look at us to be faithful in what you've entrusted us with. And Lord, again, so often these things that we have to go through, they're just testings. They're testings that we might be trusted with all your treasures, Lord. So I pray your grace, your mercy, your peace be upon each servant in the body of Christ in this conference, Lord, and just continue to lead us into your heart and in your desire for our lives and our ministry in Jesus' name. Amen.